The Andrangheta is one of the world's most powerful mafia groups, running huge sections of the global drugs trade. But very little is known about how they actually operate. In this episode, we're going deep into the secret world of the Calabrian Mafia. I'm J.S. Raffaelli. I've spent years writing about drugs, why people take them, and why our governments chose to declare war on them. At Vice, we make a lot of films about drugs, but in this show, I get to dig a bit deeper. I get to talk to fellow expert drug nerds about their research into the crazy world of mind-altering substances. Anna Sergi is a professor of criminology from Calabria, who's dug as deep as anyone into the mysterious Ndrangheta crime families. Anna, welcome to News on Drugs. Thank you. So this is a complex subject, but what's a simple definition of the Ndrangheta that we could just start with? The Ndrangheta is a criminal organization coming from Calabria in southern Italy. Italy has four original mafias. Cosa Nostra, which is the biggest one, which is the Mafia from Sicily. The Ndrangheta, which is the Honor Society from Calabria. The Camorra, which is the collective name of very disparate clans in the Campania, Naples region. And then the so-called Apulian Mafia. There are many minor mafias as well. The Ndrangheta has become the wealthiest of the Italian mafias. It's considered the most far-reaching in terms of international links, and that together makes it the more powerful. At the same time, its control of the territory back in Calabria remains solid and in some places almost total. And what's their source of revenue? Drugs. Drugs is their source of revenue, and especially cocaine. They were at the right place in the right time, and drugs became basically their El Dorado. At the same time, they still don't disdain uh, local protection rackets and various other traffickings, including uh, arms, weapons. They might even engage in different types of drugs, apart from cocaine, obviously. Some of the clans partner up in some occasions with other groups, including the Camorra, or in the north of Italy with Turkish nationals or um, Nigerian nationals for other types of drugs, specifically cannabis. That completely changes when you move out. So the Ndrangheta in Australia is particularly into meth. But one thing that needs to be really, really, really clear is that when we talk about the Ndrangheta, we are not talking about one unique strategy. We are talking about each clan that can do different things. And how is the Ndrangheta structured? Clans, families, blood, Sarname. Sarname counts more than anything else in the classic Drangheta structure. But the classic Drangheta structure is a family bound by Sarname and by alliances of marriage that come together. You have one or two Sarname for clan. Each clan is called Ndrina. Each Ndrina is autonomous. We can do whatever the hell you want as long as you don't enter in some feud with someone else. When you read in any news that the Ndrangheta is behind a big shipment of cocaine, the question everyone needs to ask is which Ndrangheta, which clan, which family, which person, if you can get to the person even better, but which family, which clan, because it's not a whole of the Ndrangheta situation, never it is. It's one clan that does one thing at a certain point. When the Ndrangheta does business in Canada, the Ndrangheta does this in Australia, which Ndrangheta is the question to me. And when you were investing in this, you did find other Sergis who were involved, right? Yes. Tell us a little bit about that. The good Sergis and the bad Sergi. The Sergi clan, which is a Ndrangheta clan, is particularly well known for the kidnappings and for drugs distribution and importation in the Milan area. That creates many problems for the good Sergis. And have you at any point in your research felt unsafe yourself? I felt paranoid for various reasons, including the fact that I was told they know what you're doing and they know you're talking about this too much. They, they, they. And I kept thinking, who are they? And there's this idea that is really the point of making you think that there is an, an entity somewhere put me really not at ease. Okay, so we've discussed the particular rules of the Andrangheta. Now, what is the Santa? 
the Santa it's a secret sect within the Ndrangheta, <laughs> which is already a secret organization. Some selected people were given this new ranking of the Ndrangheta, which was called the Santa, the saint. And once you had this, you didn't have to be involved in crime anymore, as in street crime. But your intent was to forge links and uh, do white collar crime. So um, get money from public works and have a say or an influence on public life in terms of elections, politicians, and all of that. Tell us about the role of ritual in the Andrangheta. Rituals are important for newcomers, mostly. You also have importance placed on oaths that are given during the promotion <laughs> ceremonies, which also resounds like a Masonic ritual as well. Por primera vez en la historia, se conocen públicamente videos con rituales secretos de la mafia calabresa. Incluye, entre otras cosas, ceremonias de afiliación. <laughs> The symbolism in the Ndrangheta is so specific that it's pretty much fake at this stage. The real families of the Ndrangheta, the original families of the Ndrangheta, the most important families of the Ndrangheta, they don't do rituals at all. You don't need a ritual to tell you that you are Andrangetista if you are. The new families, they are really fond of rituals. The rituals have meaning for the new families is because the old families don't do them anymore. So the rituals give identity, they give a meaning to it all, to basically tell yourself that what you're doing is for a different kind of cause. It's not because you are just a criminal, you are a mafioso, it's different. And you are from Calabria originally. Yes. Did this play a role in your own upbringing? Absolutely, and I tried to push it down as much as I could for the sake of my research, but I eventually I decided that being from Calabria is actually an asset. And my father was a journalist for most of the 90s and 2000s, in particular the periods of the feuds uh, where different families repeatedly killed each other for years until they could get control of the territory. Those were periods of brutality. One of my first memories when I was in my car with my father, he had this gigantic cell phone, which tells me it must have been the early 90s, and he receives these calls. He, he knows basically something happened in that place nearby. We have to make a detour. My father gets out of the car and tries to, to understand what's happening, and I hear words. I hear the, there is a feud, someone died. But more importantly, the thing that stuck with me is that someone says, I don't see it, thank God, that they are playing with a severed head uh, in the square and that there is commotion about this because obviously if, you, if people are playing with a head as a soccer ball, is you know it's something to notice. And then my father gets in the car and he asks me to give him uh, my Barbie doll. And I had this Barbie doll. So I look at my father, it's like, why are you doing this? And my father is like, well, I need your Barbie. We need to give it to the girl. It's like, we need, we need to make, give her a, something, give her a gift. Her father had just been killed. I think it's important that we describe Calabria and the ways in which it's sort of unique from the rest of Italy. Calabria is beautiful and it's very different from the rest of Italy. Calabria is the poorest or the second poorest region of Italy. It's together with Sicily a land of migration and the vicinity to Sicily obviously makes it a transit zone. So many people that visited Calabria only because they had to get to Sicily. And if you stay, there is this feeling of a constant struggle to exist. It doesn't feel like you have the same kind of opportunities than other parts of Italy, because the system around you does not really exploit all that it can exploit. Calabria is a place where politics has not done its job, still doesn't do its job. I mean, mafia is one of the many agents of this. Here in the southern Calabrian town of Plati, not a single candidate is running. The Undrangheta crime syndicate assassinated two mayors here in the 80s, and the fear lives on. Perché devo fare l'eroe, no? E quindi da questo punto di vista c'è la maggior parte della gente e persona onesta, ma in Calabria per essere liberi non basta essere onesti. Calabria has been defrauded basically by lazy politicians, which sometimes are way more harmful than mafias. We have created a, a feeling that everything bad that happens here is normal. Things don't work, it's normal. I can't find a job, well, it's normal here. So everything that goes wrong is somehow internalized as normal. 
the Andrangheta is most often linked to cocaine trafficking, and specifically in Europe. How dominant is it in this market? If we imagine the cocaine trade in Europe as a small table of big players, then Drangheta is definitely part of it. There have been many changes in the cocaine trade in the past years, and especially the one change that has completely brought it off the charts is the increased production that allowed increased importation and increased number of actors who can import. So it's changing, and it's changing fast, and that requires partnership. Now, the Ndrangheta clans who are into this, they've been around long enough to learn how to adapt. That doesn't mean that they earn less, by the way. That's the thing, right? So the more cocaine production goes up, the more cocaine there is, the more we trade. Even if we have to share more, there is still enough cocaine for us to make enough money. So it's not about getting rid of some of the profit is about being smart enough to realize that you can have the whole cake. And that seems to be a particular talent of the Andragheta, yeah. to form partnerships with other criminal organizations, particularly the cartels in South America and people from the Western Balkans, Bosnia, Albania, Montenegro, etc. Yeah. They do seem particularly talented at this kind of collaborative work. Do you think that's fair? Absolutely. The Ndrangheta was born out of collaboration. And that's the reason why we are talking about the Ndrangheta today. But when Cosa Nostra was the most active, which is the 80s, the Ndrangheta was already there. They were already formed. Some of the families that rule the cocaine trade today were there back in the 70s and the 60s, or even the 50s in some cases. They are very, very long-standing dynasties. And they were helping Cosa Nostra. They grew out with Cosa Nostra in the shadow of Cosa Nostra, but not because they were inferior, but because they, they were just convenient to them. So the Ndrangheta offered their services and in order to continue the heroin trade that Cosa Nostra was doing. So out of that, they essentially moved up the ranks and became the ones who forge partnerships rather than the ones who just accept it. But if you take the typical Sicilian mafioso, he really likes himself, he really likes to hear himself talk, he puts up a persona. The Sicilian mafioso wants you to know he is a Sicilian mafioso and he's there for a reason. Drangheta is never like that. They are not the kind of show-off. They always tend to stay in social distancing from the crimes they commit. I don't know if it's, uh, it's ever been a strategy, but it's the way the Drangheta, some Drangheta families, the most important Drangheta family group, don't get seen, don't make noise. They don't like to expose themselves. The Drangheta became what it is after the state passed a million rules and regulations against Cosa Nostra. So we're not gonna see a Martin Scorsese and Drangheta movie? I would be very surprised, <laughs> very surprised. And it seems like in the development of the Andragheta, the 1990s are like the key transitional period, yes. right? In those years, the state is in shambles. In Milan, they discover a set of bribes, how bribes were systematically paid by political parties. The feuds end out of a so-called Pax Mafiosa, the Mafia Peace. In the 90s, the clans decided to agree on peace and essentially put up some rules of coordination where we don't end up in the same situation again, where it's not just about these two families in this small village that fight each other. We are all in this together. So the Ndrangheta families had the money to get into cocaine. They had the money because they went into the kidnappings for 10 years. So the kidnapping season is a period that goes from the late 70s up until 1994. The kidnapping season was strategic, it was planned, but the money that was paid was enormous. We are talking about billions of liras, millions of euros, and these euros had to go somewhere. But in a very typical Marxist situation, it's pure and simple accumulation of capital. It, it's meant to step up from local extortion and local street crime and becoming the big guys. So that kidnapping season was really a conscious thing of like, we're going to accumulate capital and we're going to invest it in cocaine. I think the, the idea was we are going to make it big somehow. Right. On one side, Cosa Nostra was down. So that meant there was a vacuum in the trade. So the 90s is the culmination of all of this together. And so some of the Andrangheta clans were so interested in cocaine that they built their own port to import it, right? Yes. 
1994, the port of Gioia Tauro becomes active, finally. Now, Gioia Tauro had been in the making for 40 years. Obviously, you don't build a port out of nowhere. It has received funding from the state. It has received funding from the European Union. At the time, it was the only well-suited place of Italy to host the container ships. The Ndrangheta families of the Gioia Tauro town, they are quite well-versed in the economy of the port. They have invested in the port in the sense that they have gained the works to build part of the port infrastructures. They are involved in providing the materials with which the port is built, so they literally built the port. And they could do that also because they have particularly good grasp of the hiring processes. That essentially means that you could have a non-stop route from Colombia, from Brazil, especially Santos in Brazil was a very key important port for the Ndrangheta, into Gioia Tauro directly. That was the glory of the Ndrangheta. Because where else in the world you can have a criminal organization that imports huge amounts of cocaine in its own territory? Normally you have very important criminal organization that import huge amounts of cocaine somewhere where they have a good grip of the territory. But we are talking here about a port where the same family can have a say in who gets hired to work in the port. At the same time, other parts of the family handles the criminal business. So you have your port, you have your roots. Why would you spend money on paying someone else when you can send your own? So the Ndrangheta created a modus operandi uh, for cocaine, which is what everyone else uses today. The spread of the Andragheta mirrors the spread of the Calabrian diaspora through yes. immigration as compared to like the Sicilian Cosa Nostra who like went to New York. Where are they most strong? Okay, so in Europe, we have two examples of settlements that are quite long-standing. One is Switzerland and one is Germany-Switzerland. Territorially, there is no separation, not even in terms of documents, and it's not uncommon for Ndranghetisti who live in Milan to do business in Switzerland and those who live in Switzerland to do business in Italy. So they exploit the existence of normative boundaries. Germany is the same, but Germany also was uh, one of the locations of migrations during the war. So obviously that created a different type of settlement of communities abroad where entire clans have duplicated themselves. There are small hotspots, let's say, where only a few families are active in Belgium. And then obviously the French uh, border coast of Italy for the same reasons as Switzerland. Canada is probably the one country that excels expectations uh, when it comes to mafias. Uh, they had them all, they had Cosa Nostra, new Cosa Nostra, old Cosa Nostra, uh, the Ndrangheta, old Ndrangheta, new Ndrangheta. So Canada is uh, peculiar now for many reasons, uh, but generally the families can benefit both from the reputation of Cosa Nostra families in New York, with whom the Ndrangheta families have business coordination uh, for drugs and from settlements that date back in the 50s. And then Australia. Australia is my favorite in a way. It's uh, really interesting because it never had any other Italian mafia but the Ndrangheta. And it has almost 100 years of history. So it's really embedded uh, in the history of the country. Really, It's not even Calabrian in a way. There is no deterministic link between migration and crime. So it's not automatic that where Calabrians migrated, then Rangheta followed. What do you see as the future of the Andrangheta? The Andrangheta is not um, invincible. However, mafias at the very core is the systematic abuse of people's trust and the systematic usurpation and arrogance of privileges. And that is very human. I don't think that's ever gonna go away. Whether we call it Ndrangheta or Mafia, that doesn't matter. New generations are changing the organization. Technology is changing the organization. There will be different crimes different commodities. Whether or not the same people will manage to diversify, we'll see. The Ndrangheta as a criminal organization might eventually cease. I'm not that optimistic.